Okay. Hey everyone, and welcome to World Conservation Summits. And uh, my name is Tanya Anderson, and I am your host on this amazing summit. And today we have let's see Michelle Desilets. Okay, you get to share <laughs> with your last name, my friend. <laughs> it's Desile, but but I'll, I'll allow that as well. Desile, Desile, yeah. Michelle Desile. Nice yeah. to see you, my friend. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So nice to have you here. It's a blessing. So who is this lady we are looking at? She is director and also founder of the Orangutan's <laughs> Land Trust. And I'm going to share a little bit about the mission of it. And Michelle will dig deeper into like, where does this passion start? Like, where does it come from since she chose to start a, 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 a place for Orangutan and save them and really protect their natural habitats? So the mission of Orangutan Land Trust is, the mission is to provide uh, stability, stability solutions for the longer term surviving of the Orangutan in the wild by ensuring safe areas of forests for its uh, conceived survival. Okay, that word is literally like, oh, how does that word? So yeah. my friend, Tell us a little bit about because you are funded the whole everything started in 2001, which you started this amazing organization. So yeah, share a little bit about where did it start everything and afterwards share a little bit about your amazing organization. Okay. So um yeah, I guess it all started. I've I've always loved the great apes, orangutans, orang uh, gorillas, bonobos, chimpanzees. Um, my first love was the mountain gorilla. I, I have to admit that I really loved the mountain gorilla, and I, I do not. I'm not a scientist. Let's make that straight. I I went a circuitous route to get here. I was a school teacher, uh -huh. and during my holidays, I would go off to Africa or Asia to go try to see these animals in the wild. And it was in 1994. <laughs> what's that? Almost 30 years ago <laughs> that I went to Borneo. And I met a little orphaned orangutan that stole my heart and changed my life forever. His name was Somalia. And I proceeded to return to, um, he was like kind of in a rescue kind of center, but not very much one. Um, I proceeded to go back and forth to Borneo to, to look after orphaned orangutans as a volunteer. And there I met a a most amazing woman who would end up being my best friend and um, partner in crime. And that's your native, uh, Lona Drosher Nielsen, um, who's yeah, quite well known, I think, in your country for, for the amazing work that, that she's done for her rank dance. So we got into our heads, me as a school teacher, her as an ex-airline uh, uh, attendant for oh, wow. SAS, yeah that we could do this better than than the place that we were volunteering at. at. We, we thought we could improve welfare and have a more um, dedicated system of rehabilitation so that, the, that these orphan orangutans could you know really survive back in the wild, not always be at a rescue center. So with that crazy thought, I went out looking for money. She went out looking for land. Um, we both found what we've we're looking for, and it came together in 1998. We we opened the uh, Nairomenting Orangutan uh, Rehabilitation Project in Central Borneo. Now, 99% of the work was low. Now, I must give her credit. Um, I was more of a sounding board and cheerleader and fundraiser for it at that time. So uh, at, at that time, I also opened what was called the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation UK. Now, the Nairomenting project was under uh, the Indonesian NGO known as Borneo Orangutan Survival. So I opened up this, this um, charity in the UK to, one, draw attention to the plight of orangutans um, and, and launch campaigns to, to you know, better protect them and also to raise money for the project. Now we created this sanctuary with the, uh, an idea that we could take in as many as a hundred orangutans. And back in those days, 
Um, most of these orangutans were coming from the illegal pet trade, international or local. People are keeping them as pets. So kill the mother, keep the baby kind of thing. Um, and then in the early part of the 2000s, uh, oil palm, the cultivation oh of oil palm for the palm oil that we, we eat in so many of our products, um, really took hold in that region. And suddenly it wasn't baby orangutans so much anymore. It was, you know, adult wild orangutans, mothers and babies, all, you know, displaced by the clear cutting and the, the burning of their forests, starving, um, victims of human wildlife conflicts, or, you know, shedding wounds and gunshot wounds and, ah, oh, just the most horrific conditions you can imagine. And that little center for 100 orangutans soon had over 800 orangutans. Oh, wow. That is and a we, huge number. Yeah. And we're struggling for funding and, you know, it just couldn't go on. The, you know, we we all, we all never turned away an orangutan um, up until then. And then it became, oh, my goodness, we're, we might have to turn away orangutans simply because we don't have the space or... Is you still there? Maybe she's coming on again. We will wait to see. Maybe this is my internet that is shopping. Let's check. Stay tuned, guys. No, it's still, still on. Is I'm still live? Let me see. Um, this is better. Are we there? Oh dear, we got we got disconnected. I don't know when. You looked frozen for a while there, so I wasn't sure. Uh, you were sharing about um, around the 800 orangutans and yeah. you saw you may like say no to a uh, tick orangutan in your organization. Yeah, yeah. So Lona pointed at me and she said, Michelle, this is your job. You need to figure out what we're going to do about this problem because we can't just have these orangutans keep flooding in. You know, if if your bathtub is overflowing, do you get a mop? Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um are you still there? You look a little frozen. I'll no, keep I'm talking still anyway. <laughs> I'm still here. We aren't losing. It is maybe it's your internet, Michelle. I don't. My internet is strong right now. Let's see. Let's see if you can. It's still live. Dear me, I don't know what's happening. It, I don't have anything here that's saying I've got a bad connection, but. Oh, I I, I believe it's, it's also okay. I was checking on YouTube if it was, was on my path, but I can see myself talking. <laughs> okay. So I don't know when I cut off this time, but let's go back to Lona. Lona saying to me, you know, it's like the, you've got a bathtub overflowing. Do you quickly go to get them up or do you turn off the tap? She said, we need to turn off the tap of the, these orangutans fl flying in. And, and she gave me the task to look into the issue, what we're going to do about the, the palm oil. How are we going to deal with the governments that are you know, driving this, the international and local companies that are you know, financially you know, really interested in this? communities also yeah. that depend on it for their livelihoods and so forth. Um, how do we, first of all, get them to stop killing and, and maiming the orangutans? And then ultimately, how do we stop them from taking their landscape? Um, and when I started moving into that kind of work, looking at the solutions for that, it became clear that we needed like a, a different organizations. So the Boss UK organization was still very much focused on the cute little orphan orangutans and fundraising, adopting out money for taking care of the babies. 
um, and the other people involved were not so interested in this bigger picture kind of thing. So I went away and I started Orangutan Land Trust again with Lona and some mm. of the, the trustees from Boss uh, UK. And that was, again, where the, the, the idea is to enable sustainable solutions for the long-term survival of the orangutan in the, in the wild. And that is by <clears throat> ensuring that their habitat remains intact. Um, yeah. And the only way we're going to do that is uh, in cooperation with those stakeholders who have an interest in that land. Yeah. Um, and and that has been a focus. I mean, we still fundraise. We're, we're not a fundraising organization per se, but where we do raise funds, um, it is directed to partners on the ground mm. um, who, they, you know, lately we've been fighting fires. I don't know if it's been in your news, but Borneo is burning as it does most years. Oh but this this year is really bad again because of the El Nino effect. Um, so the whole Southeast Asian region is blanketed in haze from these fires. Um that some are naturally occurring, others are set to clear land. So we've got teams out there trying to fight these fires and prevent fires from erupting, rescuing animals from the fires, mm -hmm. uh, working with communities, so forth. We have teams restoring forest. We have teams rescuing orangutans. We've got a new problem in the eastern part of Borneo where coal mining is driving huge, oh. you know, catastrophic destruction and we've got as many as a hundred orangutans that need rescuing from these these coal mining concessions so we've had an emergency fund trying to get you know the rescuers out there to be able to pick up these orangutans um mm -hmm. but a great deal of our work is more sitting behind computers or in uh, meeting rooms in singapore amsterdam or jakarta trying to work out solutions um, for, for these drivers of deforestation. But it's crazy. Like, do the government not see this benefit to, like, protect uh, the natural jungle with the orangutan and yeah. the sun be bears fair. and all that amazing yeah. animals they see in it? Yeah. Um, it's been a long struggle, but um, the Indonesian government in recent years has really um, shown a great deal of progress um, in fact, Indonesia's rate of deforestation, particularly deforestation caused by oil palm, has been declining on a steady basis. And in, I think it was 2022, reached the lowest rate of deforestation since 1990. So, so they're really, and a lot of that comes down to government initiatives of yeah. you know, no, no new plantations and you know, forested areas, as well as the the voluntary kinds of certification systems like the round table for sustainable palm oil. Um, and and uh, so there's, there's a lot of factors going into why the deforestation and, and you know, subsequent loss of, of uh, biodiversity has declined so significantly. And it's also declining in Malaysia, you know, the other uh, country where, where orangutans live. Um, yeah. So it's showing, yeah, some willingness, but it's still... It's still a struggle. Uh, today, the um, Minister of Environment of Indonesia denied that there's any fires, you know, and Malaysia is just like, oh, wow. they can't even see 10 feet in front of them. <laughs> oh, so, gosh. yeah. Um, so there is there is a, a sense of denial at the same time as, you know, some good work. Yeah. It's, yeah it is, it is, is it? positive of the government have started to open their eyes to see the benefits to protect the jungle of many yeah. reasons. Also, tourists is coming to to Borneo to see like this beautiful jungle that is down there. Um, ecotourism could present a solution, a part of a solution. Well, you know, you can't replace all the economic development that takes place from mining and oil palm with ecotourism. Ecotourism in Indonesia is very, um, yeah, it's very much behind what oh, really? you might see in Malaysia. It's not well organized. There's a lot of unethical ecotourism, especially surrounding orangutan viewing. 
um, it's not been priced out. You know, like if you go to Africa to see orangutans, uh, yeah. see gorillas, even yeah. um, you pay a lot of money. Oh yeah, for that privilege. And I mean, I remember I was thirty years ago, and I think I paid eight hundred dollars for one hour with with the gorillas. And of course, the small group, and you kept your distance, and and it was all very much in the gorillas' interest more than yeah. the tourist interest. And that kind of revenue was enough to turn around the the almost ensured extinction of the mountain gorilla to now that mountain gorillas are are you know increasing year on year, be, yeah. almost solely due to sustainable ecotourism um, and that huge revenue that it made uh, made it worth keeping them alive. Mm-hmm. Um, that is kind of lacking in Indonesia. Because historically, uh, I mean, particularly around orangutans, um, historically, it's been just far too easy. Just rock up with your backpack, pay $10 for a, a park fee, go up and hang out with some orangutans. And, oh, and there's sure. no there's no controls on to, you know, whether they have contact with them or you have oh, any sure. health screening. Um, and, you know, I think at, at Camp Leaky, they say they could get up to a thousand tourists a day. I mean, that's that's just crazy. That's not good ecotourism. And none of that money is really it's going to a couple of tour operators, but it's not going to the conservation of the species. And yeah, well, so so I'm real rethinking point. of of where ecotourism there is some good ecotourism um, and, and where we could take in the future. Um, but I think more importantly, it's it's all eyes on places like Indonesia or Brazil or whatever in the deforestation and governments now the eu has a a new legislation on um, companies being required to ensure that the ingredients it's the, i think there's six seven main ingredients or or commodities that they purchase are free from deforestation so rubber uh beef mm-hmm. uh soy palm and others fall fall in, onto this so so now companies will be required to show that that any palm oil coming into the EU is free from deforestation. Um, so oh. it's in Indonesia and Malaysia's interest to ensure that they're producing deforestation free palm oil, which means they're saving forests. So it's it's that kind of interplay of markets and um you know the the political level of of n- you know, you can't hide this away anymore. You, you're you you're responsible to the global community for protecting your forest and your biodiversity. Mm. Hmm. So what is the, if I can say like the status or how is it going with, you have said a bit about it. How is it going for the rank tank in the wild? Okay, so... um. The orangutan, all there's three species of orangutan. There's the oh, Sumatran, really? yeah, Sumatran orangutan, the Borneo orangutan, and the only in the past few years was identified as a separate species, the Tapanuli orangutan, um, which lives in Sumatra. Now we knew they were there, but we didn't know that they were different from Sumatran orangutans as far oh, as wow. their their. Uh, genetic history and 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 morphology and so forth so the tapanuli is the rarest great ape in the world with only 800 um individuals more or less left and they're all all of these species are um uh, considered critically endangered one step away from extinction but these are the most critically endangered the most likely to to go extinct in our timeline if we don't take immediate action um and that is due to uh, mining as well as a um, a planned hydroelectric uh, dam in the region that will divide their habitat and yeah really spell trouble for them. So a lot of work being done there. The others, while being critically endangered, they're not likely to go extinct anytime soon, but they'll be in that really critical um, area. Um, and that's because in the protected areas where they live, their populations are pretty stable. You know, we're doing a pretty good job at looking at them in national parks and protected areas. Not too bad, but the fact is most orangutans don't live in national parks and protected areas. Um, they live in these areas that are 
fragmented by other uses such as mining and oil palm. And that's where the real work needs to be focused on. And that's where we stand to lose um, tens of thousands of, of orangutans if we, if we don't pursue sustainable development agendas and um, you know come up with these these solutions for for their survival. Um, mm -hmm. And some of those solutions, you know, involve you've got a pocket of orangutans here. Sorry, I'm dropping my headphone. Um, maybe that population isn't viable, and you've got another small population, another pocket of forest, not viable. But if we connect it to them and they can move freely and breed freely amongst um, each other without being killed, <laughs> um, then we have a viable, you know, genetically viable population that can go, you know, breed into the future. And, and uh, you know, because they are slow breeding. So so oh, really? it's very, yeah, uh, mother orangutan only has, depending on which subspecies you look at, what region, um, has an infant every six to nine years. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So, so if you take out a female or there's no male breeding stock, then it, it would take so long to replace the loss, um, numbers, right. Cause they, they don't breed fast enough to replenish the stock, that kind of thing. So oh, that is yeah. crazy. So. I did not know that fact. Yeah. That's, that is a little bit like, that is a little bit crazy around that facts. Yeah. Wow. So, and, and they're all protected in, in the region, you know, that like by law they're protected, but in oh, practice, okay. you know, as seldom does someone who is harmed or captured or sold in rank 10, um, have any kind of, you know, jail sentence or fine, you know, it's just brushed under the carpet. And so there's not a lot of disincentive for breaking the law and, and harming a protected species. And that's, that's something that, you know, really presents a challenge. That's a little bit crazy. If they are yeah. protected of the government and someone yeah. steal them or kill the mom to take the baby, yeah. uh, they do not get like a fine or put in the deal as mm -hmm. other country. Like that yeah. is horrible what the, the, yeah. the punishment is. Yeah. So that is crazy. That is crazy. So around to the audience, uh, how can they help to save the orangutans where they are or as a tourist what is your yeah. um, guidance for the audience okay well there's there's lots of lots of things you could do if if you want to go see orangutans in borneo or sumatra really do your homework and make sure you're going with an ethical um organization uh, are you still there michelle Can you hear me? Let's see. She will definitely come on in a bit. Stay tuned, guys. She's coming on. She's on again. Yeah, we <laughs> dropped off again. Where did we get where did we get knocked off? What was I saying? Uh, your questions, you did not really answer the questions. Like, what okay, can how can you help? Okay, so I, yes, I was started talking about tourism. So if you, you would like to go and see orangutans in Borneo or Sumatra, do your homework, get in touch with us, make sure you go to a, a location where the orangutans are um, properly being cared for and not exploited for tourist use. Um, we recommend the Borneo Rangtan Survival Projects. Uh, there's volunteer opportunities, and there's also a company called The Great Projects who, who also take you to the boss projects. Um, we can always use donations of any size. Um, you'll be surprised how far, you know, 10 krona go in, in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just... I mean, yeah, there's there's inflation, but you know, it's it's very satisfying to see how far your money could go. So, we, so you know, we we really welcome donations. Um, but the, the the one thing that everybody can do, um, almost every day to save orangutans, and we we totally believe this because oil palm 
is so catastrophic for orangutans and their habitat. Um, we believe that the single most important thing everyone could do is make sure they choose and demand only sustainable palm oil in the products they buy. We don't call for a blanket boycott. We don't say say no to palm oil because that would be counterproductive. We need to drive this industry to be more sustainable, to protect orangutans. And you don't do that by walking away from the problem. You do it by uh, favoring the the those companies that are responsible and looking after wildlife. Um, and, and yes, go ahead and boycott the companies that aren't, um, yeah. if you like. But it, it's about, you know, sending that message and, you know, even a tweet to, you know, a brand you like um, or, or a supermarket and say, hey, uh, can you tell me if, if the palm oil in your products is, is sustainable? Um, this is something that's really important to me. Um, this kind of continuous message to the manufacturers and the retailers um, really has already seen a, a great shift. Most of the palm oil that's coming into the EU is certified sustainable. And that's only because, you know, uh, informed consumers concerned about these issues are demanding it. So we really, really ask people to look for sustainable palm oil. If you go to our website, which is right now a little bit wonky, it's having some problems and is being rebuilt. I apologize. But there are some um, uh, tools that can be used that can help you find what products are using sustainable palm oil and what, oh. which are not. So that that would be the most important thing we can all do. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Some guidance because there was an organization that found the show like all the e numbers of palm oil. Palm oil have oh so yeah, many, so hundreds many yeah. kind of names. I'm gonna sort you... names over thirty names, just like oh more oh, than that, hundreds, like, hundreds. Like, how can I remember all the names? Yeah, of it? no, and that that's ridiculous to think anyone would. Yeah, it's because palm oil is very versatile and and you can break it down into these different chemical compounds that each have their own properties that are good for uh, shampoo or okay. uh, something going in your vitamins or making your toilet paper extra soft or these okay. kinds of things. Um, and, and you can't possibly look at every label and see if it's on there and then know if it's sustainable. So it's, it's better look, you know, like there's something called the palm oil, a scorecard from the WWF that they look at a big company that mm. produces, you know, thousands of products and how are they doing on sourcing sustainable palm oil? Um, and then you can have confidence across these products. They're good. Or if they have a bad score, you might want to avoid them or give them a, you know, a tweet and say, Hey, get your acting gear. I don't, I won't buy your products until they're sustainable. That kind of thing. So well, that's, I like, I like that communication. That. We really love social media um, for for you know bringing the the balance to this story. Yeah. Not all palm oil is bad. Not all palm oil kills orangutans. You need to make a distinction between good and bad. Yeah. And by choosing the good, you actually drive progress. By just walking away from problems like, oh, I don't want anything to do with palm oil. I'll use a different oil. Okay. So now we're destroying the Amazon with soya. You know, because you've used a different oil or yeah. That, that is true. And it's just like, I, I skip it even. I go to another kind of oil. Do you know where the oil coming from? Like the yeah. first process in the whole process? Because what I say is it, what you buy, you support on the first process on the whole one. So you get yeah, yeah, like, the whole value like chain. Exactly. On the clothes, in your yeah. home, like you support the whole step by I mean, step. You could argue that, okay, well, if I use um say rapeseed or sunflower oil which isn't developed in the tropics okay that sounds good but on a global scale it's not a replacement for oil palm because it is so much more land hungry that to replace the palm oil that we consume with those oils you would have to clear like well like all of germany or something like this you know every every bit of you know landscape that's given over to anything urban or whatever would have be you know converted just for sunflowers and so it's 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 about the yields so like the palm oil uses its yield is between five and ten times as great as its competitive 
oils, which means that much less land has to be converted. So a palm oil provides 35% of the oil, vegetable oils that we eat globally, oh, yeah. but only on about 6% of the land that's given over to vegetable oils. So it's that oh. balance. You get a lot of oil from a little land. If you change oils, you get a little oil from a lot of land. Um, and so you're just I, move, um, moving the problem somewhere else. I've never think about that. That is true. Yeah. yeah. Because the palm oil day is like, as I know of my awareness, you know, so much more than me, myself. is like when I was born, like the palm tea and they have like this palm oil. It's like a huge, huge, big, like, bowls what you call like they're cutting down compared to mm. going over to like sunflower is a so small flower and you get oh, to yeah. have so many more compared to what you get in one like palm tree as i can yeah, it's, it's actually yeah it's actually opposite you know than, than that you know like if you had you know 10 square meters of sunflower oil versus 10 square meters of of oil palm you can get a lot more oil out of that oil palm than the sunflowers those, yeah. i mean those those fruit bunches they're like like almost like oh, yeah. grape clusters they weigh like 40 kilo i mean they're just huge they you know it's they're, like they're dangerous when they come down you gotta run away because they, they kill a person you know so and and you can extract the oil from the flesh or from the kernel and like oh, wow. yeah they and they produce they produce year-round right? They can be harvested year round. So that's another reason why, you know, companies like them because you have a steady supply, the, the price is kind of stable. You, you know, you're not going to run out in March and have to change your formula or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and the oil palm will produce um, the oil be, you know, fruitful, so to speak, um, for about 25 to 30 years. And then it can be replanted. Um, if if you manage the land properly, replant it. So, so in a way, it's renewable, and you know you don't have to move to another field to plant the next bunch. You can just keep using the same field, so you don't have to expand. So, I mean, that's that's one of the main things is to make get as much use from the land you have. Make sure you get as much oil out of the land you have, rather than expand and clear or impact other mm. areas. If you are not going to expand, because companies do expand, um, yeah. that you only expand in areas that have been scientifically, you know, with technology and drones and satellite mapping and ground truthing shown to be free of forest, to be free from like human interests, like land claims or religious sacred sites, these kinds of things, um, yeah. to be free of, you know, biodiversity, you know, like orangutans and tigers and and so forth oh, nice. um not impact ecosystem services so waterways peat areas so forth so the the standards for the certification of sustainable palm oil pro prohibit you can't clear any forest you can't um convert any peatland you can't um harm or capture any uh, rare, threatened, or endangered species, you must uphold human rights and labor rights and no child labor. It's very comprehensive, all the rules that sustainable palm oil have to abide by um, for it to have that seal of approval. Oh, wow, that is amazing. I'm curious to know something for me, I'm interested to know, like what oil is the best one to buy? Of course, for me, I'm going for Danish, so I support my land. I don't know where they're coming from and all that fun stuff. Yeah. So I buy like ecologic oil in Denmark. Uh, so to the audience out there, like what oil would you advise people to go after when they go and buy oil? Because a lot of people well, think like what oil is the best one in food or to yeah. cooking? Or... Well, yeah, if you're buying oil yeah, you know, for frying or cooking, you know, you're making your own meals. Um, yeah, we mostly buy local, you know, rapeseed or sunflower or something like that. That's um, in in places you know, in the countries where most consumption is, which is Indonesia, India, and China. The the only affordable cooking oil there it happens to be palm oil. So you know you can't really tell them to swap over to olive oil or something like that because they can't afford it. <laughs> it's yeah, it's really expensive. Um, so yeah, but 
in process products, the European oils like sunflower yeah. rapeseed don't have the qualities that manufacturers need for certain products. So for like baked products, um, if, if you use those oils, your your product, a biscuit, a cookie, for example, would just go all flat and horrible. If you made it with butter, it would have a very short shelf life. It would go rancid very quickly. And then you're adding to food waste. So you need mm. to balance that. So the, the palm oil has a very long shelf life. It's stable at re- relatively high temperatures. It doesn't impair the flavor because it's virtually odorless and flavorless. So if you stick it into something, you it's not changing the flavor the way, say, olive oil might change the flavor. Ah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, olive oil does. Yeah. So, so in your products that use a vegetable oil component, you'll find that about 50% of your packaged products do contain palm oil because it serves it, its purpose yeah. in so many ways. It's used in chocolate quite a lot because it gives what they call good mouth feel. It feels nice in your mouth as it melts. Some people disagree with that. You know, you want a proper chocolate and I'm all for a proper chocolate that just has, you know, cocoa butter and you know, no other additives. So there's things that you know, definitely don't need any other oil. Um, that's fine to say, you know, I'll go without oils, but where an oil is needed, the palm oil is very effective. So then we say basically the best and often only alternative to palm oil is sustainable palm oil. So it's not only the best, it may be the only alternative Mm -hmm. in a lot of these products. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's, Good, good stuff to be said about buying local, supporting your local industry, you know, keeping food miles down. But in a global scale, um, you know, you are going to be consuming products that have ingredients from all over the world. Um, it's going to be virtually impossible to to avoid unless you're like a forage or living off the land or something like that. I wish. Um, <laughs> um so where where you are doing that, then we 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 say look for the sustainable palm oil as the best alternative to palm oil. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, definitely. and again, that's a that's more at the global scale, isn't it? It's about impacting global value chains, and your little purchase can make a difference collectively in those messages that are sent to the Indonesian or Brazilian governments. Yeah, you know, the fact that. The EU has come up with this this requirement for deforestation free supply chains is, you know, again, as I said, it's a result of people becoming aware of the ingredients in their products and not wanting to be complicit with driving deforestation. So wherever your product is coming from, it better not have any deforestation associated with it. And that's that's, you know, now at a legislative level. And that's because of, of people you know, individuals like yourself, um, you know, understanding the issues and calling for responsible value chains. Mm -hmm. That is so powerful. I'm just like, I'm just thinking about like, oh, I think about my own lifestyle. It's like, mm, that's good advice. <laughs> Not like I'm skipping all palm oil as I did in the beginning. I was probably like, we will activate. I'm cutting everything. Yeah. Even I mean, living, you boycott. Living. Yeah. Boycott palm oil. You might as well boycott air and water, and you know these kinds of things. But it, boycotting palm oil is, we say, it's kind of like walking away from the problem. But yeah, exactly, demanding never... sustainable palm oil is addressing the problem. It won't I've... fix it in itself. No, of course. But it's course. it's progressive. It's moving towards a more sustainable future. And I find very exciting is you know we started this work on on palm oil. I mean globally the. Greenpeace's of the world and myself and WWF yeah. back in 2004. So we're almost 20 years working on this issue. Um, we've we've made tremendous progress in that 20 years as far as you know how much of the global production is sustainable versus however long it took for uh, FSC, the the Forest uh, Stewardship Council, to yeah. get the same amount of you know. Uh, change in the system. Um, but for me, what's exciting is that 
other commodities are now looking to what we've done with palm oil. So you've got a, an emergent soy round table for sustainable responsible soy. You've got it for sugar now. You've got it for cotton. You've got a new one for rubber. Um, so people are looking at all kinds of things that we consume and they're following the work that we've done on palm oil and how do you make a standard? How do you involve all the stakeholders into making a standard that's acceptable to all players, to the NGOs, social and environmental, to the governments, to the, the manufacturers, the retailers, the consumers. How do you create something that moves around the world and is produced and consumed every day? How do we make that a trajectory for, for a responsible future? Um, and, and to me, that's really exciting. It is. I'm My brain is just like <laughs> like thinking. <laughs> It is just so interesting when the point around, I think it, that is so powerful. You're the first one I hear that. It's like, I hear a lot of people say, um, as I did also in the past, now I'm going like, really like looking at the pro product, like what is the e number? Google it. Like Google is my friend. You can find everything Google yeah. what this e number is. Um, and I, it, when I choose palm oil as the S in my shampoo, uh, I use person. where the stamp is with the, a sustainable palm oil like the certificate they get to have um and in the past was like i'm cutting everything and i can see that it's so interesting you say that if we just cutting like palm oil because we see this like big challenge we are just moving one challenge to another challenge i've never think about that so that is that makes it so powerful like in my mind it's just like whoa and now michelle is you still there you're jumping on again. <laughs> You're still on again. We're back. <laughs> We're back in business. Yeah, I, I, the point was like, I think it's so powerful. If we move one challenge, we just move the challenge to another one. Instead of like, okay, this is the challenge with the power. What can I, as one person, do to make a huge impact? That is, as you say, like, send them a message or post on Instagram, post on social media to really push to it forward uh, what is why sustainable palm oil is so important and say to the big company i will say no to support you and i will support you again when you choose to cut all your palm oil and turn that into sustainable palm oil and she's out again <laughs> it's still here <laughs> i really apologize again i don't don't think it's my fault but it's okay. It's okay. okay. I'm just right. like I'm looking at my thing. It is what it is. Um, so, yeah, the last word you have um, before you share the last word, where can people get more information about you, you guys and your organizations and also Palmon? You say you have an error on your homepage where people can look more into Palmon, also WWF. Uh, they also have like sites to get more information about a sustainable palm oil. So where can people find you guys? Okay, so we are at www.forests, that's plural, F-O-R-E-S-T-S, -S, the number four, and then orangutans, O-R-A-N-G-U-T-A-N-S dot org, O-R-G. You can also find information on sustainable palm oil in some detail and some blogs by myself um, at the sustainable palm oil choice. You will be back in a bit. Can you still hear me, Michelle? Nice look on the internet all right she will be back guys okay let us see let's see let's see let's see if it is working she's coming in again all right and where did i cut out that time uh, the last the, the not your organization what you're sharing about uh, where people also go to find yeah. more information okay about. sustainable palm oil choice that's www.sustainable palm. I think it's sustainable palm oil choice, or is this sustainable palm choice? And Google it, sustainable yeah. palm oil choice. 
dot com uh or not dot com dot org anyway google it there's lots of great information blogs from wwf myself uh other organizations um and chester zoo also has some amazing information especially for schools and educators lots of great stuff there about orangutans and sustainable palm oil um you know, most of the, the orangutan organizations have great information. Smarter and Orangutan Society, Borneo Orangutan Survival um, come to mind that they have some good information about sustainable palm oil. Um, I think those those are probably your best sources. If you want to find out more detail what it means to be sustainable, uh, you can go to the site of the Brown Table on Sustainable Palm Oil, which is rspo.org. Um, and surely, if you have any questions about orangutans or Narmenting Center or Lona or Palm Oil, you know, always just get in touch. Get in touch through the email address associated at the um, uh, website, and we'll be happy to chat with you. Um, happy to chat with schools or universities, companies whoever might be interested in learning more about what they could do to help the orangutan and its rainforest habitat. Amazing. And the last advice, Michelle, you have for the dear audience, what will that be? I think just pursue a life in harmony with nature and, and your everyday decisions really do have an impact on nature. Um, and that's particularly true with the orangutan. Um, you know, it's a little harder, you know, you're talking about rhinos, for example, and well, what can we do about rhino horn? I don't buy rhino horn, so stopping buying rhino horn is, you know, here. So, you, yeah, obviously you support the organizations that protect those animals. But here with the orangutan, even if you have no money to support the, the organizations, your behavior, your choices every day makes such an impact on wildlife and, and the planet. Um, so make them sustainable. Amazing, amazing. And to you, dear audience, thank you so much for watching this amazing interview with Michelle and I. And we really wish you and hope you choose to go to their webpage to click on and follow them on all the social media. And also really dig in, take a half hour today and really dig in the information about what is palm oil and what is sustainability of the palm oil and what take three product you have in your home, take a look at it, discover where it's coming from, connect, the, or connect with the company and ask about it. So we will invite you to go and follow the organization on all social media, take a half hour to really dig in what is sustainability around palm oil and look at three products you have right now. If not today, do it in the weekends. And thank you so much for watching. And to you, dear Michelle, thank you so much for you and what Lona is doing for the orangutan and for the natural habitats and the amazing work you're doing. It is so critical and your voice is amazing and a voice definitely people in Denmark know about you. So you're touching little Denmark. <laughs> Great. Lona will be pleased. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you okay, so much. thanks so much for listening. You're so much welcome. Bye, everyone. Bye, Have everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.